Hi, everyone. I'm Oprah Winfrey. Would you answer true or false to the following statement? My emotions and my thoughts have a direct bearing on how physically healthy I am. And one, I'm sicking, I'm sick and my mental attitude can help to make me well. Well, my guests today say that both are true, that there is a crucial link between the mind and the body. My first guest is a surgeon who works with cancer patients that other doctors have sent home to die. He tells them not to abandon conventional treatments like chemotherapy, but to combine them with a whole new belief system about life and the purpose for living. His remarkable results are documented in his book. It's called Love, Medicine, and Miracle. Welcome Dr. Bernie Siegel to the show. Thank you. My second guest says that there is a direct connection between our emotions and our vulnerability to disease. Specifically, he says that certain emotions increase the risk of strokes and may even trigger certain viruses to cause disease. He even says that tumors have been known to shrink if a patient thinks them smaller. Welcome clinical psychologist and author of Super Immunity, Dr. Paul Pearsall. Welcome. <laughs> If you can think certain tumors smaller, why can't you think other things? Why can't you think if you have colon cancer, why can you, can't you think that you don't have it? Or if you have a heart murmur, why can't you think that you don't have it? Why do you have control over some things and not control over others? Well, the point is you have a great deal of control over everything. Right. The idea is that every thought you have results in a shower of chemicals that alter the body, its defense system, its immune system, its healing capacity. There's a healer within that we have control over. There is disease, there are things that break in us. Illness is a natural part of living, but we all get sick sometimes and we can find that healer within. Somebody once said it, that God cures, the doctor sends the bill. Hmm. That must have been God who said that. <laughs> <laughs> And you have d documented many, many cases of people who appear to have miracles in their lives, but you say there's no such thing as miracles. Yeah. Solzhenitsyn, in his book Cancer Ward, used the term self-induced healing. Yes. The interesting thing about medicine, if you get back to bills in business, medicine is the only business that has not studied success. Mm -hmm. We do a lot to people who don't do well. Nobody stops and says, why don't you get cancer? Why don't you have AIDS when you meet the AIDS virus? Uh -huh. And what I'm saying is if you study survivors and you study success, you have something to teach. It is not an accident when you don't die when you're supposed to, according to a doctor. What is it? It is a change in you and a change in your life. That's part of what we're talking about. There are things called neuroreceptors. You are a body-mind. You are not a body and a mind. If you change, your disease changes because your body changes. Really? Yes. You're a body and a mind. You're not just a body or a mind. Yeah, you want some interesting yeah. facts. Things like people with multiple personalities yes. can have a disease in one personality, not in another. Can have allergy in one personality, not in another. And this goes all around the planet. That Isn't that if, fascinating? Don't yes. That's fascinating? <laughs> yeah. Nobody ever told me that in medical yeah. school. Nobody ever told me in 1933, I think it was, Carl Jung interpreted a dream and made a physical diagnosis. So I work with dreams, with drawings. You know what's going on in your body. We can bring that awareness out. So does this mean that each of us has control mm -hmm. over our diseases? Remarkably so. Listen to a bunch of surprising things they never taught me in school either. We're the only animal in the world that dies on a given day of the week more than other days, that is Mondays. People, the majority of people who have a heart attack. <laughs> Let me interrupt that. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me interrupt this for one second, too, yeah. because that's a very important statement. Number one is we all die someday. Get the bad news over in the beginning of the program. Death is not a failure, okay? Yes. But at the hospital, everybody dies at 2 in the morning. We have incredible control over when we die. Now, there's really? a reason for why? that. Why, why, why? Well, my comment is try dying at noon in a hospital. You see? <laughs> they won't let because, you. Right. Our <laughs> reputation is based on you're not dying. And yeah. the other is families, that you don't say to each other, I love you. You say, don't die. You're a rotten mother, kid, you know, yeah. father. So you die at 2 when the family's asleep or left. But if you have that kind of control over turning off your lived mechanisms, you also have a lot of control over turning them on. Remarkably so. When you have gallbladder surgery, if, you have, if your room faces trees instead of a wall, you're out about a week earlier. 
if people lose someone. This has been documented. Documented yes. data. Hospital this is not a matter. Yeah, absolutely, Study. it's not a matter of opinion. That's the point. That it's wherever there's gold, there's counterfeiters. Yeah. So you hear a lot of people getting blamed for getting sick. You hear a lot of people using this incorrectly. But this is data. This Let is me not ask you this, and I know that people don't like to use the word blame. So maybe you could use another word. If you have control over your emotions and your emotions cause you to be physically ill in many cases, then aren't you responsible then for getting sick? Certainly, we're responsible for our own life. But right. that's a big difference between understanding the healing capacity of the person to deal with all of life and not view illness as a failure in your life be and that between and comparing that to saying to somebody see what you've done you must have been depressed and that's why you got cancer there is no data to prove one emotional state documents the disease in another time in your life. Let me see, say, see this right. is confusing to me. Because isn't this confusing? Yeah. yeah. Let me make, this can is I confusing. make it a little clearer yeah. for a minute. Please. I'm thank working you. with people every day in this way. I think the words participate and responsibility are important, right. not guilt, fault, and blame. A housewife comes in and says, and housewives have more cancer than women who work, okay? Why? Why? Let me get to that. What did the government do looking for it? If I said to you, Oprah, housewives have more cancer than women who work, you have $25,000 to fund study. Would you study the carcinogen in the kitchen or the effect of feeling trapped on disease states? Which would you study? Well, I would study uh, the effect of being trapped. Right, because and what I the know. government did was study, study carcinogen. the carcinogen in the kitchen. Yeah. That's the absurdity of it. So lifestyle and disease go together. I'll make this marriage work if it kills me is a wonderful way to die. If you get cancer, then you have a way out, die. Or you may say, now that I know that I'm not going to live forever, I'm quitting my job. See, I'm not going to marry this guy, stay married, or I'm going to change this relationship. I'm going to do exactly what I really want right. to do. and yeah. then you get better. You see, so I'd say you want to be responsible, be responsible for living your life, not let somebody else, parents who hypnotize you, you see, be a good kid, be yourself. Don't wait to learn you're not going to live forever to enjoy each day. And that's when people wake up and say, you know, I feel so good, I don't think I'll die tomorrow. <laughs> but is, isn't the bottom line, too, people who do things that they love to do, for one, become successful at doing those things because you enjoy Follow it your bliss. Yes, yeah, yeah. So follow, follow your bliss. Thank you. Back in a moment. We'll follow our bliss. <laughs> Um, how does mind over matter stop a person from having a heart attack and just dying in front of the television? But you know, Bernie said it. It's not mind over matter. It's the mind is matter. It's all part of the same thing. The mind's a body and the body's the mind. There's a lot of mythology about this heart attack thing. There isn't like a type A anxious person that's going to die of a heart attack. What we're talking about here is internal dialogue. Your reputation with yourself. For years, we've heard theories about the type A person who has prone not to, enough. Prone it's to heart not attack. enough to just look at type A and, and, and anxious behavior or real active lifestyle. It's what that internal dialogue about why you're doing that. I had a husband turn to the wife in the clinic the other night, and he said, I've given you all the best years of my life. She turned to him and said, those? I was waiting for, for some meaning to this. I mean, what, what are we doing this for? The question we ask our patients is, what is your life for? So to look at it in terms of watching TV or just getting hyper in response to one stimulation is not the issue. The issue is to ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing and what am I getting from this? All right, let me add something directly to heart attacks. Do you smoke? Are you overweight? Do you exercise? Okay? Y people who are mentally healthy have one-tenth the physical illness and death rate after graduation from college. Do you like your life and what you're doing? You take men who have heart attacks, you teach them how to love in group therapy, and the rate of reinfarction is down by a half. You take men in Israel who have had heart attacks, and you ask them the questions. And if the question, one question was, does your wife love you, is yes, the likelihood of another heart attack is way down. What you do to those vessels has a lot to do. If you hate the world, but if the answer and you're watching is, I don't know, and I wish my life had been different, and, and my life isn't what I want it to be, and, and I just change it. Yeah. Yeah. That's my yeah. answer. It doesn't answer at all because there's some other things too, but thank you. Well, you remember those other things though, in terms of the majority of people who die of a heart attack, and I know Bernie as a physician will agree with this, have none of the risk factors associated with heart attack. I'm not saying you should smoke, that's terrible, but they don't smoke, they're not overweight, they don't have diabetes, and they die of heart attacks anyway. We have to look at the emotional components. You wanted to say what? Yes. 
Hi, yes. I do a lot of work with people with AIDS in Chicago, and uh, we use, well, it's a Thursday night support group, and we use guided imagery, visualization, and most importantly, touch. And I know you did a lot of work with William Calderon and Dr. Right. Siegel. I would like you to stress how important it is to people in new diagnosis or who have been recently diagnosed that if they begin taking care of themselves, that they have a much better chance to become a long-term survivor. Yeah, there, when I was in San Francisco yes. last June, there were written up in the paper three men particularly who were alive five years after they had a diagnosis of AIDS. Part of the reason I keep talking is the stories are the same. These are people who say, I'm living as if it's the last month of my life. I am living my life, not making myself guilty. I think what we will come up with also, interestingly enough, as the treatment for AIDS has to do with these neuroreceptors. Why does somebody who meets the virus not get AIDS? There are a lot of people walking around with an AIDS virus in their body. And it may well be that the white cells are protected by these neuroreceptors. And they block the effect of the virus. And this is why peace of mind, leaving your troubles to God, clear conscience, being hugged, talking, sharing, living each day is therapeutic, what I call physiologic. And coming together and touching, using the imagery, talking to your body. See, I talk to people under anesthesia, and their bodies listen. Don't bleed. Tell them what pulse rate to have. Tell them they'll wake up comfortable, thirsty, and hungry. So that when you communicate with your body through emotions and through images and the hardest part of all, you see, is coming to a group. What I learned when I sent out 100 letters to people with cancer saying, I'll help you live longer and better, come to a group and share, 12 people showed up. There are a lot of people out there who want to die, Yeah. you see, and that's what we also have to get around. Yeah. They're you don't not the it. statistics you don't believe you're it. living. Okay. Yeah, stand up, stand up, say Because a lot of people are saying, well, my father died, my mother died, my cousin died, my sister died. Are you saying they wanted to die? They may have uh, the day they died, because if you said to them, how do you feel and would you like to keep living like this, they'll say no. Would they like to be alive and well? Sure. There's some interesting studies coming out on this, for example. <coughs> Listen to this finding that will surprise you up, up front. People with the closest social support systems, the most loving families, tend to die sooner when they have a terminal illness than those patients with more distant family ties. Why? Why would that be? Why? It looks at people become comfortable with their death at a certain time, when it's time, and are able to leave the family for the family, to take the stress out of that whole system. I'm not saying that they just give up the ghost. I'm saying what they do is become comfortable me, enough to say it's time for me. There's an important point here. As I said, death is not a failure. Right. If people have loved, what I say to people is you want to be immortal, you have two choices. One is to go to medical school because doctors don't get sick and don't die. <laughs> but the other and most significant one is to love somebody. Thornton Wilder said there's a land of the living and a land of the dead and the bridge is love. I'm teaching people to love. It's physiologic, it's healing, and it leaves something in the family. But it certainly you makes your living life a lot better. Yeah. You but do you say there's a lot of people who die who would like to be alive? Sure. I take care of two-year-olds who die, 18-year-olds who die. But that's what life is about. Pain is a reset button. I didn't create it, you see. The what only do you mean you when you say it's a reset button? How do people change? What's going to make you change? When you hurt, you change, you see. That's when you go to a group for AIDS or AA or drug addiction or single parents or abused children. Stop waiting for the pain. Live your life now. Believe. How can you make, convince these people who are skeptical that it, that's really something that is going to work. What we have to do is realize that this is not, again, just pop medicine. For 15 years, beginning in Russia when they looked at this, they were doing research and the data is out there. Ask your physician, ask those who care to read. Think of this, for example, with chemotherapy done 15 years ago. Chemotherapy works in sometimes by leading your own killer cells in your own body to work better. That's an oversimplification, but it can work that way. So what they've done is say, let's have somebody smell some mint, give them chemotherapy, and they'll get more of their own killer cells. Eventually, some of these patients, by learning, like Pavlov's dogs did, can smell the mint and get more killer cells with less chemotherapy. That's teaching your own immune system. That's the miracle we're talking about. Yeah, you say what? Yes, how does all this relate to genetically transferred diseases? Well, there's an old joke, and it's a bad one, that if your parents didn't have children, you won't either. That is to say that ge <laughs> genetics are... <laughs> Genetics are crucial. That's what Bernie and I are saying, that disease is a part of life. We're, we're not making war on this. It's a part of life. It's, when he said it's a reset button, there is no growth without crisis. Let me give you a good answer to that, too. There are certain genetic defects, but again, you get back to what did the mother feel like while she was having that child? See, what did she eat, drink, or poison and herself with? And you're going to say with? that changes you? Now, yeah. Now, I meet in my office. I 
one of an identical twin. At age 29, one of them dies of cancer. At age 58, this man walks into my office, said, I've been totally depressed for a year, trying to drink myself to death. I now have cancer. I want to turn my life around. I've decided to live. They share the genetic material. 29 years later, another is sick. What I'm saying is, and what we're finding also, there are DNA repair mechanisms in the body that are enhanced by positive attitude and thinking. So you have repair mechanisms in your body too, and you don't have to live out that genetic But makeup. it's not gonna prevent you from getting a disease that is genetically transferred. No, your family. it may not. If you have that defect, yeah, you can be born with it, right? So you can't change it by thinking. No, but how you experience it. How you experience it, yeah, and how you live with it. You're not going to live any longer, I don't. Maybe. You, know, you may. You may. Don't say you're not. You may. You certainly won't if you don't believe they you. They said, won't, here are two brothers who got oh, the right. same genetic material. Right. Why didn't sure, they die within always, a month of you each have other? To have a positive it depends attitude. if it's a diagnosis or it's a verdict. <laughs> if it's a diagnosis, you can deal with it. We'll be right back. What amazes me is that there's always such resistance to change. And I do lectures around the country. And in those lectures, many times I say to people, yeah, I can tell you how to be successful in your life if you just follow what your heart says, your inner spirit says, and not be directed by what outside sources your mother said, your cousin said. And don't do things in order to make money, but you do things to bring you joy in life. And those things that bring you joy will also bring you all the other things you're wishing for in your life. But it is so difficult to convince people that seeking joy will bring you joy instead of seeking money and material things. And the same thing that we're trying to do here today when you say, I can tell you how to be healthy and make yourself a healthier person, but people say, but it's in my genes, or my father had it, or my cousins had it, or how do you, how do you break down that kind of well, resistance? This is why I feel so much parents have such a statement. See, I meet people who say, my parents said to me, you're a scrawny kid, you live to be 90, and then they'll run you over with a steamroller. That lady has gotten through every crisis in her life. If your parents give you negative hypnotic <coughs> messages, because they're in you, they're an authority figure, you live them out. And that's why I say it takes a whack on the head to say, I'm going to forget what my parents told me. And this is frightening, because this is a new responsibility for right. self. We are used to going to the physician to be repaired, to go to a mechanic <laughs> instead of a gardener. I can't tell you the high percentage of people who leave a doctor's office with prescriptions for medicine, with sublethal dosages, with lethal substances, a large percentage of which are really not going to be helpful anyway. And if that same physician was trained to say, let's sit down and talk about how you love, how you live, and I want to talk to you for a while, some of those patients would be mad at that physician. Right. But if he said, here's a love and joy pill, They'd they would it. take it four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Caller, you say what? Hello, you're on the air. Hi, Oprah. You're great. But uh, I wanted to ask your guests how you can use your techniques to handle pain because um, I have to have an operation which is going to leave me in a body cast for uh, close to a year. But because I have two small children, I can't do that All right, let right me, now. Let me shorten the question say buy the book and read the list. But we have a list called good patient, bad patient in the book. What's interesting is those people considered bad patients by the hospital get better sooner and walk out because they're independent, keep their clothes on, and so forth. Um, but what you do is talk to your body the night before surgery and say, tell the blood to move away from where I'm going to be operated on. Those patients who say that lose half as much blood in the operating room. So you talk to your body, you visualize it as successful. You talk to your surgeon, you know that it's healing. You have him talk to you under anesthesia or take a Walkman into the operating room with you so you have a pleasant experience and don't hear anything negative during the procedure. And it's a whole host of relationships and communicating with your own body that will get you out of there. And if, I have to say, I would ask you to draw a picture of yourself in the operating room and talk about it with you. But if you see this as an assault on your body, you'll have a lot of pain. If you see this experience as being healed, then you will also wake up and not have the pain. Well, that's it. Mark, my question was, I have, I have to put it off for a year because until my kids are old enough to go into preschool. All right, so you're dealing with pain, you mean? For another year. Then I would, again, work with imagery, um, warming the area, seeing it being healed. By the time the year's up, maybe you won't need an operation. I don't know. But work on your body, communicate with it, yes. And there's something controversial about this that we're looking at in terms of sexuality, to really get this uh, to be a heated argument, I'm supposing. But touch, fulfillment is very important, intimate fulfillment. We can demonstrate it right in the audience right now. Watch how this audience will change in five seconds if you're willing to do this. 
Hold up your E.T. finger. Remember E.T. had that glowing finger that healed people? <laughs> Touch the cheek of the person next to you gently. What? Mm -hmm. He's touching the wrong cheek over here. Up here. Okay. Okay. Now, see what's happened in the audience? A stupid little simple thing like that, and people are smiling, and they're feeling closer. Well, I asked some doctors the other day, I said, show each other your teeth. They wouldn't do it. They just, I said, just smile for heaven's sakes. Another thing we do with our patients is say, make a fist. Watch you try it. Every other person in the audience, make a fist. First of all, the hot reactors, people who are very hot, will, will make the fist quick. I'll make it. You're not going to be the... Every, come on. <laughs> Every other person, make a fist. Come on, try it quick. It's e easy to do. Now, the people who didn't make a fist, open that fist as quickly as possible. People who didn't, open the fist of the person next to you. Okay? Make a fist and then open a fist as quick as possible. Now, what we looked at is some patients do this. All right, I give up, all right? <laughs> Other ones said, try to open that, try it. But the people we were measuring is the people doing the opening. All you had to do was ask. I'd like you to open your hand. We don't take the easy ways, the intimate ways, the sensitive, intimate ways. Somebody once said, we are all Haven't angels. Haven't there been tests also that, that when you do this and do that, that shows that your immune system either goes up or down? You, yeah, yeah, ahead, you can see the effects in an intensive care unit of yeah. being touched by a nurse, of families coming in and saying, I love you. And you can see the vital signs improve and change. Sure. That's why you get back to the hugging. We're made to touch. I go around the hospital hugging everybody. I mean, I've gotten over worrying what people think about. There's a yeah. barrier to that. Somebody once said, we're angels with but one wing. We fly only when we embrace. Yeah. We must learn to touch. See, the laugh that I get also is the day we prove physiologically, which we've shown, that hugs are therapeutic. Doctors will write in the order book, <laughs> hug four times a day, and yes. we'll have a hug therapist, <laughs> see? You won't go down the hall and hug. I hug people all the time. You show students, this was done at Harvard, a movie of Mother Teresa, and as they leave the theater, whether they like the movie or not, their immune system activity, when measured, was higher. So it, it shows all what we're talking about is going to be old stuff in 10 years. It'll all be very scientific and old stuff. Back in a moment. very difficult to be positive. I just started a week ago chemotherapy treatment, preventative chemotherapy. I have breast cancer and uh, I think it's really difficult at this time to be positive. What do you say to someone who's undergoing this experience to help them get through it? I think there are a lot of things involved. Number one, I would say to all these people, draw yourself getting chemotherapy. There are several aspects. And what does that do? Well, because a lot of people why? snicker because when you you're say you're dealing that. at two levels. One is intellectual. See, I ought to get chemotherapy to get better. But then your unconscious hears, I'm going to give you some poison to kill any cancer cells. And you say, God, who wants to have something killed and poisoned? So you say, I want to get out of here. And so that brings conflict. I would say to well, you... We also worry that it doesn't work. All right, wait a minute. Uh, look, you have to make a decision. Do you want it or not, number one? If you go in in conflict, well, we have one lady who drew the devil giving her poison, okay? You go to the devil to be poisoned, you will have a lot of side effects. If you have a physician you can relate to who treats you as an individual and you see this as a healing substance that you send to any cancer cells, not to your whole body, because if you go in frightened, it's going to affect you more, then you will do far better. Um, and so that's really where you but have see, to deal with. you know, that's with. very, I understand what you're saying. It's difficult to do because intellectually you can swallow that. Yes. But when you really have to go in and do it, right. you, how do you erase you fear take, from you your subconscious? Then you take with you, with your meditation tapes, with your healing music tapes, and you listen to them. You're in a room where you see the sky too because we see that. You have a little mm -hmm. cubby hole where you get your chemo. You're much more likely to get sick than if you can look out the window. Yeah, I um, had one treatment and I almost passed out, yeah. and that's just not like me but at all. What I would do also is help people with the imagery part. See, you could go home from here and have 10 chemotherapy treatments in your mind with your eyes closed. Each one, you get up, feel well, smile, and go home. And I would visualize that success. Tell you one story. In the cover of our book, I don't know if you showed it before. We there's did. A, there's a rose, okay? <laughs> now, the rose got there. I didn't know why the rose was there. And the man who made the cover said, oh, in your book, it said there was a lady who went to the doctor for chemo with her husband, got into the car and would throw up. So he'd hand her a bag and she'd throw up on the way home. And she said, one day I opened the bag. There were a dozen roses in it for my husband. I never vomited again. See? Um, 
you can, I would add one more thing. You can give men injections, this was done in England, of water and say you're getting chemotherapy, your hair's going to fall out, and three out of ten had their hair fall out. You can talk to your body. You don't want your hair to fall out, tell it not to fall out. See, tell your chemo to leave your scalp alone. I mean, you have a lot of control over You obviously over what did not do that, Dr. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming back. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I was going to say, how would you, how do you suggest that um, basically healthy people that are always very nervous, how do you suggest that um, they go on with their lives to um, stay healthy? Well, there's an interesting point that we want, don't want to lose sight of here. We're talking about love and happiness and smiling and joy, but there's nothing wrong with the other side either. Life is a balance here. And we got to be careful you're not yelled at when you sit down and are being a little sad and somebody comes up and says, smile or don't be nervous. There is no research to show that these states are going to make you sick. It's accepting the whole range of feelings. If you want to get down about if the there's no research to show that wait, these make you sick, then what are we talking about? I'm saying that if, just that in itself is not enough. It's a cycle. Otherwise, we're, this is going to end up as this message. If you smile and you're happy and you're in love and you're married and you have a partner and everything goes well, then you're healthy. But if you're sad and you're angry or you're nervous, you get sick. That's not true. It's being able, it's what you say to yourself about that that goes on. What's going on when your chemotherapy is going on? If you feel like crying sometimes, it's okay to cry. If you feel like yelling, it's okay to yell. I did rounds at the hospital once and they said, this patient's not doing well with his death because he's not going through the dying stages appropriately. He's not at stage four. He's throwing things around in the room. I said, my prescription here is to help him throw, put rubber ashtrays in there if we have to, and let him throw, let him die his way, not us. We are not the, the gurus of a new medicine. We are scientists sharing the possibility of a new apothecary of chemicals that heal from within. A little nervousness ain't bad. It's that pendulum going too far right, too far left, modulated as well. Let me put it in simple terms. Okay. What he's saying is don't perform, okay? How are you? Fine. What's wrong? Nothing. Yeah. Then you will die faster because you confuse your immune system. So be yourself. If you feel nervous, say, I'm nervous. If you're depressed, say, I need a hug. I feel lousy. There are therapists out there, too. Talk to people. Yeah. If you, people listen to you, you will help heal yourself. Don't just sit home and say, I'm a nervous person. Don't accept that. Go out and change. We will be right back. How does this relate to holistic nursing? And also, if this is a system that works, why is it that when you go to nursing school, they teach you about studying all the body parts and what works and what doesn't? And when you get into the hospital, you find out the most thing that a person needs is someone that talks loving, warm, caring, respectful, and also respect their position in the hospital. And I also want to ask you a question. How does this relate to Le Boyer? How is a, you know, a child, when they're going through this process, are they better people when they get older, or how does this affect them? I think, that, number one, from the standpoint of our training, the problem is, as in medical school, you don't meet people until about the third year. So you are oriented towards disease. I think that medical school training will disease when students and you know, nursing school make noise about it and patients make noise. Um, I get the most support from the nursing staff because they're with people all day. They know what's happening in their lives. And that's why I'm still practicing and supported. Um, it, from the standpoint of how children are cared for, yeah, I think the contact, the love, all the things from the moment you're born uh, are very important to you. You know, you're a lovable creature when you're born. Those who convince you you're not lovable are the problems. Yeah, caller, you say crucial. what to us. Go ahead. Caller, you're on. Uh, yes, um, I'm very skeptical about all this. Um, sure. The doctor said earlier that. Um, uh, you know, pe people pass away like in the middle of the night and everything. And I had a family member that passed away at 12 o'clock. Like he said, that no one can pass away at 12 o'clock. He didn't say no one could. Well, <laughs> all right. For, for well, no one, my no family one. member did, okay? And he had everything to live for. He, he just did not want to give up. Number two, about the comment about uh, if you have gallbladder surgery and it depends on the view you have, either a brick wall or, you know, a street. I was in the hospital. I had my gallbladder taken out. And I had, I think, far better than what the doctor said, you know, with the, uh, the street view. I had a view of the courtyard with a carnival going on. 
Okay. Okay. Great. A carnival. Now, that's not supposed to be happier than watching cars going, you know, passing by on the street. Mm -hmm. I was in there 10 days, and the doctor originally told me I'd be in in five. It, well, what you hear here is it's not that what you're actually seeing. It's what's going on inside you that matters. That's, what we're, that's what's controlling this healer with Can we just get that straight, that it's not, no. what, please. It's not, it's the, not the external stimulation we're talking about, or 12 o'clock noon or something's magical. It's, it's the spiritual aspect, if we can dare use that word. And where the breakthrough is going to be, even for this yeah. caller. That's the bottom line, though. That yeah. is the most important thing. That's the bottom line, here. that there are no atheists in foxholes. When you go through the crises of these problems, all of a sudden right. you start to look <laughs> to your belief systems. Yeah. If we don't get into the medical schools and the nursing schools and train this way, I take my male gynecology residents put them up on the pelvic exam table, put their feet in the footrests, and turn their testicles so they can see how it feels to be up there and understand that. You want to help. Huh? So what he's can saying, we, what we're trying to, to say here, caller, is and we appreciate we, your skepticism we because we know her. you represent, you know, millions of people out there. But what he's saying is a tree can't do it for you. If you're looking out a window at a tree and you're saying, well, I, I had a tree and I had trees and carnivals and I still was minute, in there 10 days. A tree the can't point. do it. The study was a brick wall versus the sky. If you see the sky, it's a spiritual connection versus a brick wall. If you were in the hospital 10 days and your doctor thought you'd be home in five, barring something he did wrong in a sense of complications, I would want to talk to you about how you felt about the surgery, what was going on at home, why you had so much pain, what conflicts are going on in your life. Yes, you can die at noon in a hospital. Usually that's a good sign that you have talked to your doctors and your family sitting around you loving you and you can say, I'm tired and I'm sore and I'm leaving my body now. I do not want to reside in it anymore. It's no fun living. It doesn't mean you don't want to be alive and well, but it's tiring to go on forever. And that's what we're talking about. Thank you, caller. We'll be right back. Question for you. My father was a very sick man, and he had a wonderful family, a loving wife. He developed um, polycystic kidney disease, had his kidneys out, was on dialysis for three years, and he was very positive, always very positive, very happy. He ended up developing heart problems, had open heart surgery, and died of different complications. And you telling me that he didn't want to live or that he wasn't positive? No, you're not listening die. because there's of the pain. There's a lot less painless ways to die. Pardon? There is a lot less painless ways to die. I mean, yeah. why did he have the surgeries? He could have just given well, up. He, he must have yeah. really wanted to live. Right. Yeah. I don't argue with you. Okay, well, how can you help with your theories and your methods? How can you help people like that? How can you help people not die? Never. Death you is a well, part you're of You're saying what? that if he, you know, he's thinks if but spiritually he's positive and he really you, wants wait, to live. Stop, That's okay? what you're telling us, isn't stop it? Stop a minute. <laughs> right? You're not listening, which is part of why you're having the problem. Everybody dies someday. There are a lot of people who don't go into dialysis because they want to be dead. He went through dialysis. It said, I have a loving family. I want to survive. I'll go as far as I can. He did. Nobody lives forever. Hopefully his love stays with you. That's all. What I'm saying is there are people who live for three years and 10 years on dialysis, and there are some who live for two months on it or with cancer. I've seen people who learn they have cancer and are dead in a week, and they have walked into the hospital looking well. So their will, the will to live is physiologic, but you cannot live forever. And when you get tired and you get worn out, you stop. What an important message that is. If this gets distorted, we have failed today. If this becomes a, a franchise, that people go in and start trying to think positive, and if they die, they failed, and we start getting points scored against us, we've misunderstood the message here. We're only asking about maximizing the capacities of the healer within, a natural apothecary of chemicals that can rally the The point is maximizing, not trying to live forever. See, if you said to your father, don't die, go get dialysis, how long do you think he would have lasted? Earlier in the show, you said the man who had the heart attack, if he had a positive, a positive attitude, was less likely to have a second one. I did not say positive attitude. Well, I said if you wrong. taught someone to love, to love. then you the love. chance make, of having can, can we a stop reinfarction here? is 50% of the control. Can force. we stop here? Because I think that there has been a major misconception on, on your part and probably many of your parts. You think that, that we're talking about what this, this woman said earlier. People think you're talking about positive attitude, mind over matter. Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? And that is not 
what we're talking about. Can we just it, clarify that? It does affect survival. An optimistic <laughs> out view does affect survival. Sure. People, you put people in a concentration camp. You give them an illness. Survival is not an accident. That's what I'm saying. I didn't say people don't die. Okay? Yeah. But you're also talking about the way you live right. your life. Not just See, mind. I worry matter, about the, the word I'll have a positive outlook as a performance. I'll walk around smiling. Being positive is hard work. I talk to people about peace of mind. Right. That's right. a different yeah, you feeling. Understand. I understand what you're saying about positive attitude. I think the, the mind is very powerful. But a lot of people's perceptions here today are that you you're you're seeing this as a solution to every medical problem. Okay, that's how I'm perceiving as no, what, what we're you're saying, saying is it's just as silly to ignore the healer within as it is to ignore the healers of modern medicine that are available to us. Whenever you're building a bridge, there are people building on both banks. And why is it when I talk to people about, you know, you shouldn't eat too much, get too much cholesterol, it's going to clog those arteries, not good for you. People will say, gee, that's right, I should eat more sensibly. But if I say that a lot of stress in your life is going to exacerbate the cholesterol levels, then they get mad at me. And they say, well, I don't want to hear that. That's, I had one guy the other night when we're in our, our, patients, our heart patients group, and he said, you're talking about me being hostile. I'm not hostile. I am sick of being told that I'm hostile. I will not deal with this. I eat right. I jog. I do everything right. There's a difference between fitness and health. We'll talk about the difference between fitness and health when we come back. There are a lot of people in health clubs spending lots of money on health club memberships trying to get fit, and still they are paranoid and crazed and schizo inside. Some yeah. of that is fear of death. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a lot of stuff done cosmetically that has nothing to do with life. Can I add one other little sentence to that lady? Mm -hmm. One of our patients said, you have to have faith in yourself, your doctor, your treatment, your spiritual faith. That's what you're hearing from us. Don't get mechanical treatment and leave your body and your spirit out of it. Put them all together, you're more likely to survive, live longer, enjoy living. What I'm saying is this is not just us against the world at all. I mean, good physicians are behind this. It's not an us so, And again, what we're talking about One, is maximizing. I think right. the, the maximizing. Yeah. You see, this came up before in somebody's question that most physicians do not read immunity and psychology and psychiatry. So they say, where does all this come from? The new field of psychoneuroimmunology is breaking down barriers and sharing this information. That's why I say a decade from now, it'll be in medical schools and... They still need to class. Yeah, I know that, but who, you see, but part of it is, in case you didn't know it, physicians are people. Go and hug them. That's what I tell people. Change your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Scary no. stuff. Do Caller, it. you say they what? Hello. parents too, and they've got pain too. Caller, you on the air? For a week, you know. I love your show, Oprah. Yeah, thank um, you. What I'm calling about? I'm a 21 year old housewife, and because I choose to stay home with my son, which to me is an important thing in my life. Certainly. There's a lot of financial trouble with my husband and I. You know, it, paying the bills and so forth. It, it's a lot more difficult, and I feel a lot of stress for it. And I've been recently diagnosed with having an ulcer and gallbladder problems. And I understand what they're saying about you know, the mind over matter, because I know that because I worry, that's what's causing my physical problems. But how do you, how do you, you say, change your life? How do you get out of a situation like that? How do you turn it around? Well, first, you're, Paula, you're wrong. That's not what caused your ulcer or your problems. There are a lot of things that cause that. How you eat, how you walk, how you exercise, genetics, the other factors, too. What we're saying is overcoming that problem and then looking at what also contributed that from an emotional standpoint is what you're going to have to do. You have to ask yourself the question, what's your life for? Look how you introduced your call. I'm a housewife. No, you're not. You're a person. You're a person who loves and touches. That can't be your only definition of your life. You've got to look a lot broader at what you're doing. I had a couple in the clinic the other night, and the man said, at least I'm suffering in great comfort. What he meant by that was, I'm, I'm able to do some things for me, and I don't want people to get that idea that they're killing themselves by living their daily life. A quick one-liner. If you had a year to live, what would you do with your life? Think about that and decide whether you want to sit home and be that housewife or get your husband to sit home and you take the job. <laughs> um, we've seen that happen too and both have stayed well. Live Ooh. your life. We'll be right back. There's 
one thing, I think the point that you just made was such an eloquent point. If there's one thing you want to leave us with, it is being living your, li uh, living your life. That's what we've been trying but to I've say But I've often here. said, if you have a year to live or you're going to win the lottery, what would you do with your life? When, I think when those two become the same, then you really are living your life. Yeah, you and also, would you choose to live with you if you had good taste? <laughs> How then do you begin to start living your life, like the, like the caller? Who's I think you have to sense your own mortality. You see, if you're never going to die, or another lady in the office, someday my day will come. If you've got time to sit around and wait, terrific. You'll take a lot of abuse. But if you know you're going to die someday, you will live differently. Dr. Bernie Siegel's book is called Love medicine and miracles. You'll remember it, it's the one with the rose. <laughs> Dr. Paul Pearsall's book is called Super Immunity, Super Immunity. And I thank you both for thank sharing you. with us You're today. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you both.